last speaker that we have today is uh, Scott Stockdale with uh, are you DEQ. Yeah. Okay, with DEQ. So uh, Scott today is going to talk with uh, finishing touches of reclamation. So as a few of you guys file in here, we can uh, get going. So. All right. I am the person that yelled out hammer or Tonka on the previous uh, <laughs> slide. And for the life of me, I thought most of the Red River Valley was Tonka. Um, maybe it just has drain tile in it, so it's good. I don't know. All right. I am Scott Stockdale. I am going to be doing finishing touches for reclamation and working towards site closure here. Um, this is my first day back at work after having six weeks off for a new baby leave. Um, so I will have to curb my talk that I've been doing because, uh, you guys are adults. What kind of <laughs> weird thing is that? Um, it's not all going to be curved though. So you'll see that later. All right. First thing is first, very important part of my presentation is we need candy. Everybody can take a piece. I did not expect to be this popular. So you guys are just going to have to steal a piece from uh, from the vendors if you don't have one. Don't worry, I am not going to be doing experiments with uh, the candy like I do with my coworkers. Um, it's nothing nefarious. Uh, I just found out that it takes 10 Kit Kats to be taken before anybody wants to touch a York peppermint patty. <laughs> All right, let's get started. All right, so you have messed up, cleaned up, now what? PowerPoint put that crying emoji on there. That was not me, uh, so don't worry about that. We're going to go over some of the finishing touches for reclamation, some of the things that are holding up closure on some of your sites. What we're going to cover, we're going to cover backfill, filling degrade, uh, erosion control, vegetation establishment, and I'm very thankful of the previous presentations that have been uh, been going on here. There, there's been a lot on vegetation establishment, and I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing some of that implemented. Um, removal of equipment, and uh, last one, we'll be picking up our garbage. All right, so backfill. I am going to probably just skim over some of this. Um, pretty much everybody knows to backfill their holes once they're done. Um, in fact, in my 10 years, 11 years that I've been doing this, there's only been one person that doesn't want to fill their hole. Uh, still working with that one. Um, it's more of a landowner uh, company issue, though. Um, it's a little complicated, more than it should be. But I am going to put out some precautions. Um, it's been mentioned, like I said, in a few of the presentations beforehand. Um, sourcing your fill material. Um, I know it's getting tough. I know it's tough to find good topsoil, um, but sourcing the topsoil and the material that you're getting to uh, put back in your holes is important. Um, making sure it's weed free. Um, sampling of the source material. We don't necessarily require it. A lot of people do do it. I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's not necessary though. Um, purchasing from the impacted landowner, that seems to uh, solve a lot of the issues that uh, backfill can have. All right, filling degrade. Nobody has had a hole this large yet. Um, this is something that we'd be seeing typically that will prevent site closure. And you can see that there was a trench that had been dug and it had been backfilled and didn't get quite filled up to grade. And it probably actually sunk because it had been filled during winter or during uh, a rainy time or a dry time and that rained. But stuff like this will be one of the things that we're looking for when we're doing our inspections to, uh, to get our sites closed. And what do we expect? All sites that have had soil excavation or change in grade need to be returned to their pre-spill uh, elevations. Um, this can be kind of a problem sometimes with larger sites, but uh, I'd like to like you guys to get as close to it as possible. Erosion control. Um, I always tell people erosion control is part of your remediation efforts. Once you've disturbed the soil, once you've done work there, you want to keep that soil back in its spot. 
erosion control is part of cleanup. I already mentioned that. But, you know, it's it's kind of money wasted. You want to keep that topsoil. You you bought and paid for it. The landowner has it, wants it there. Uh, we got wind erosion on top that's actually at our Gateway to Science Center in Bismarck. Um, and uh, some water erosion on bottom. But you want to want to keep the soil that you brought in, that you paid for, that you worked hard for, you want to keep that in the same spot. If I see lots of wind erosion at site, if I see lots of water erosion, like what's in this picture, I'm not going to be closing a site, not going to be, be uh, you know, putting no further action. I'm going to put this out, job well done. I actually stole this from our permits division. This is a silt fence um, at construction site. I told them that if I got a hold of it, I would uh, try to disseminate it as much as possible. But uh, this is this is a good job. I don't expect this on every site. I mean, this this is really good, but uh, I do expect some good effort towards erosion control. And what do we expect? Soils that have been disturbed or backfilled to remain in location. Like I said, it can be costly if they don't. And if we have lots of erosional issues at your sites, we're not going to be issuing no further action. It's going to just be open and open and open until we finally see those get addressed. All right, vegetation establishment. I do not expect you guys to get us looking like the Pacific Northwest. Not going to happen. But like I said, we've had some good presentations so far on establishing vegetation in some of our impacted areas. And those of you who have dealt with the DEQ know that uh, this is usually one of the last boxes that we have. And one of the uh, things that we spend a lot of our summer doing inspections for. This is a pretty typical site um, that we've just been trying to get a vet vegetation established on. Can't quite get it. You can see that there is a dead area all throughout here, not growing with uh, crops. And it's been like this for a while. Here's another example, same thing. You can see all this dead area. You can see a little bit of weeds in and around this area, but it's not being, not coming back the way that it wants to be back or, or it's not gonna be getting closed the way that we want it to be closed. And uh, this is gonna hold up a no further action if we don't have vegetation back in the impacted area. All right, and like I said, we've had some great presentations so far. Um, it can be dependent on what kind of year you've had. You've had a really wet year, you've had a really dry year. Um, it can be dependent on your crop choice. Uh, the one presentation mentioned how uh, Soybeans are very intolerant to any salinity. And it also mentioned that barley is very tolerant to salinity. So sometimes the crop choice of the landowner can, uh, can show that there's more work that needs to be done. And like I mentioned before, it is typically our last box to check off when we are looking to close sites. And what do we expect? We expect a reasonable establishment of vegetation in the area impacted. Why? It shows that there's no longer contamination and harmful concentrations. It also prevents erosion, which actually can lead to an NOV if you are having issues with erosion or causing problems to waters of the state. All right, equipment removal. All right, equipment removal, what this applies to, a lot of times with these big remediation projects and big reclamation projects, a lot of equipment uh, ends up at these sites. And what can be applied, we'll go over each one of these individually. It could be boom, groundwater equipment, any kind of special equipment. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on there. And when we want to see a site closed, when we want to get to the point where we're not going to look at it again, we're going to issue that no further action letter. We want to see all of this gone. Hard and soft boom. You know, guys, I got to tell you, this is the one that I probably get on people the most. Um, hard and soft boom. They're not permanent fixtures. 
Um, a lot of times they get left over, especially soft boom. Um, they do have a limited time for use. They can only soak up so much and they kind of lose their effectiveness. Um, hard boom, it is reusable. Um, it uh, needs to be deconned, obviously. But again, with the uh, same as soft boom, if it's left in place, it's it's not, you know, overly tough. It will begin to degrade. All right, monitor wells. I can tell you that I've never had somebody say, oh, we want to keep this monitor well in. Um, it's pretty rare, actually. Uh, but that is one of the last things that uh, that we have people, if we have groundwater monitoring equipment at the site, we will ask that, uh, okay, you know, let, everything looks good. We just need you to remove the monitor wells, properly abandon them, and then we can get this site closed. Um, I guess what we're more likely to see is people removing them too early, but uh, even that's you know not going to be the case anymore. Specialized equipment. Bill, you know this site. Don't say who it is. <laughs> um, specialized equipment. Uh, when you have a site and you have a lot of specialized equipment there um, to remediate the site, whether it be an irrigation network, um, there's a lot of sites out there that have these barrier walls, which I've seen marginal use with them sometimes. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But when we want to close the site, we're going to have to have this removed. We're going to have to pull all this. And this one, uh, what did they end up doing, Bill? Did they, did they dig down and cut it with cutting torch or did they they yank it out with a... Oh, um, this one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are steel beams that are driven about 10, 12 feet down into the ground. But uh, sometimes it's it's a lot of work, but it's still going to need to take place before we end up uh, putting a no further action letter out there. Underflow dams. Uh, we have two different underflow dams. We have one in pristine condition and one that has gone through spring runoff. Um, it's pretty... You can see the one actually still has oil on it. Um, we're going to need to see these removed after they've had their use. Everything has a limited time use, especially if you put it in a creek like this. If it's left there, if it's ignored, it can begin to degrade, begin to look like this, and it can actually lead to more issues and it can lead to an NOV. All right, posts and flags. Um, Oh, show of hands. How many people have been yelled at to have their flags removed from site? There's a few of you. Less than I thought. I expected a few more. I know landowners are not a fan of flags, and they want them removed as soon as possible. Um, same goes with posts. It kind of you know goes back to the specialized equipment. If they're at a place where they shouldn't be, they need to be gone. Um. It typically, like if you have a few flags in or about it, they do become a, a garbage after a while. So that is a part of an issue there. But uh, we, we'd like to see some of these sites or some of these removed before we want to go ahead and close the site. Sandbags. I didn't think I would have to say this, that sandbags in a creek need to be removed after they have been done or after they've had their usable use. Um, but apparently I do because it has happened to me several times. And uh, after a while, they begin to degrade. They begin to break open and begin to create problems. And like I said, they're in a creek. They're in a stream. And if you're putting things in a stream, you have to be careful because you're asking for trouble if you end up leaving it. Drain tile. This one's a bit more tricky because it is uh, something that's pretty much going to be left in the ground. Um, a lot of times we ask that uh, once a drain tile has outlived its purple purposefulness, that we uh, that we pump it full bentonite or we properly abandon it. Um, I did put this one out there as a bit of a caveat. Other agencies may have other requests because uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, places like that, if you have drain tile on uh, their property where they have a lease, they are going to have very specific rules that you are gonna wanna follow. All right, 
abandoned equipment. Um, this happens invariably. Um, a lot of times, you know, if it's a fire or an excavator that dropped down into a creek or river, in this case, um, every effort should be taken in trying to remove that. Um, I am somewhat sympathetic because I understand that there's probably going to be insurance involved and maybe they want to come take a look at it, but we need to try to remove things that are issues. This site has stories attached to it I will not get into. All right, what we're expecting. We're expecting the removal of any equipment that may cause a disruption in the general land use, become a waste, or cause damage to waters of the state. Um, we're trying to get sites back to how they are. That's why the remediation is being done. That's why the reclamation is being done. And we need to you know, make sure that everything is out of there. All right. Oh, exceptions. I forgot I had this slide. There are exceptions to every rule. This is a, a weir that was put in. And uh, I think we opted to leave this one in place because removal was going to damage the, the stream bed more than, uh, than leaving it in there. Um, it was also native materials that were sourced around there. So it, it is something that we can be a little bit flexible with, um, but we're going to have to talk it over. All right, now a little bit of levity. Mr. Rockman, uh -oh. I need your help. All right, I have a little bit of levity. Like I said, I have just come off of uh, paternity leave and I'm still kind of in the world of little kids. And obviously when I go home, I will definitely be in the world of little kids. But came across this book. It is a favorite of mine. All right, next slide. The ocean is amazing. Mr. Fish's grin was wide. The beautiful surroundings left him wonderstruck inside. His head was full of happy and his heart was full of awe. But his smile sank away when he turned around and saw a big, big mess. Whatever could it be, but he really couldn't tell. So he talked with a friend who had noticed it as well. There's a problem that needs solving, and I don't know what to do, but we're going to find some answers. Would you like to join me too? Absolutely, said Miss Shimmer as she grabbed a few supplies. They traveled to the mystery mess to see with their own eyes. Swimming off, they were enchanted by the ocean big and bright, but looming in the distance was a dark and dismal sight. A big, big mess. What's it made of, they both wondered as they pondered this out loud. Around them, others gathered in a small but growing crowd. There's a problem that needs solving, and we don't know what to do, but we're going to find some answers. Would you like to join us too? Count us in, said Mr. Seahorse as he powered up his rig. Enthusiasm bubbled. Yes, the group was getting big. They jetted through the ocean in a peaceful sort of bliss, but the thing that stretched before them was impossible to miss. A big, big mess. Who will fix it, fish were asking, hoping someone else would know. There was lots of conversation as they traveled with the flow. There's a problem that needs solving, and we don't know what to do, but we're going to find some answers. Would you like to join us too? All is one, said Mrs. Squid as they switched away some junk. The group continued forward to the nearing pile of junk. They reached the mystery mess. They took measurements and samples. They made notes. They did research. They found similar examples. When everyone was finished, they assembled to discuss. They came to one conclusion. The problem is us. We made the big, big mess. They froze in disbelief. They all began to shout, feeling troubled and uneasy, and some began to pout. Were they stuck with this forever? Would it worsen? Would it grow? Mr. Fish was worried too, but there's one thing that I know. It is awful that we caused it, but this bad news can be good, for it means that we can solve it, if we all agree we should. Silence filled the ocean. Their future was at stake. It was a moment of decision, but which would they make? A big, big yes. We can do it, they exclaimed, positively yep and yep. So they pitched together, and they cleaned the ocean up. They gathered up the garbage with help of everyone. They worked to fix and remedy the damage that they'd done. When they talked about new habits, how to travel with less trace and reduce the use of plastic and put trash into its place. Problems have solutions, so we learn what we can do. Together, we're the answer. Would you like to join us too? Now, why did I feel the need to read you a children's book? 
Well, that is the next slide. Yeah, because I've been at home with kids for the last six weeks. Picking up trash. Um, this is uh, one of the things, this is actually how this whole presentation began, and this is how it involved, evolved. Um, like I said, I've been doing this for 11 years now. Um, in the first 10 years that I've been doing this job, one finger, once, that's how many times I have thrown the NOV on uh, people not picking up their trash at locations. I did it five times last year. Now, I don't know what's causing that, but it is something that I want to get in front of. Um, obviously, we have some, some big offenders, things that cause lots of, uh, lots of damage, lots of, lots of trash. Train derailments, truck accidents, explosions, well fires, large remediations. Um, we'll kind of get into some of, uh, some of what we're looking at. Abandoned absorbent booms. Remember what I mentioned earlier, that they can't last forever? And, you know, the problem with them, especially if they're left over winter, is mice, voles, probably voles, they're, they're usually the problem for everything. Um, mice, voles, rats, vermin, just in general, like to dig into them, break them apart, and they spread all over. Um, this one has an absorbent boom, but that's not why I brought this. Absorbent pads, too. Um, a lot of times they're left. Um, they're usually where there's water. So, again, that can be problems with uh, waters of the state and, and having an NOV run for you. Um, I'd like to see them. I mean, they don't last forever. They can only absorb so much. They can only do so much. All right, we have another absorbent boom here. This one, yeah. And actually, I think the sheriff finally pulled this one out. Um, they uh, they only last so so long, and they need to be installed properly. Otherwise, they don't do anything at all. But here is one of my sites that uh, that I have. I think I had about ten emails on this site. Um, I had about three meetings on location with the responsible party. Um, one of the times the responsible party goes, oh man, this place looks like a landfill. Yes, 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 it does. Thank you. And did that clean it up? No, it took about five more emails. Um, finally I told him, I'm like, if it's not cleaned up and I don't see bags of trash, I'm going to take this to an NOV. And the next day I got an email with about 20 garbage bags lined up in a row and the next inspection, I closed it because all the trash was gone. Um, one thing I do see every once in a while, I don't, when I say pick up trash, I mean pick up trash. I don't mean use an excavator to try to push it around into a pile and then dig up the pile. That happens more often than I care to admit. Here's what we expect. Oh, yeah, I forgot my wife highlighted that for me. Um, removal of all waste on the site cleanups that is generated from cleanup or the workers at location. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you, if you create trash at the site, we expect it to be gone. We expect it to, to be, we don't expect a big hole in the ground from excavation to become a landfill. Um, here's another aspect that might be a little bit more controversial, but removal of all waste that showed up at the location from the point of remediation until the site is closed. You are responsible for that site. You're responsible to keep that site clean until we issue that no further action. I don't know how many times I've seen excavations. A lot of times they're along the road, but they have a tendency to gather trash. Um, people walk by, they throw some garbage in there, pop bottle, beer bottle, whatever. Um, but that needs to be removed because we're not gonna let you backfill over top of that. Where's the law that says we have to? And we got a few of them. We can certainly pick from. Oh, there is one last thing that I do. I do want to put forward a little anecdote. Um, this was this, not this winter, it was last winter. I was at a location and uh, I was touring a site with uh, an environmental rep for a company and their contractor. We're going down to the excavation. I see below this uh, excavator, 
uh, that the operator had thrown out a bunch of bottles, a bunch of uh, candy wrappers, just random garbage. Uh, so they weren't in his cab while he was doing his work. Um, and I saw the head of the contracting company storm over there, grab it, open the cab, whip it into the cab, and continue to use words that I cannot use here uh, at the uh, contractor, at the excavator op operator, to uh, to tell him to clean it up. Now, everybody does a pretty good job. I, I'm really I'm happy with how sites are getting closed, and I'm happy with how how we're doing. But there's always room for improvement, and here are some of the issues that we uh, we've been seeing lately. What do we do with our candy wrapper? <laughs> I think we know. I think we know what we should do. That is the end of it. Have a good day.